Welcome to another second recorded podcast. Um, we've made some slight changes to the format for this presentation, um, and these will evolve over time. So expect uh, further changes in the future. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Dan Miles, and joining me today is my co-founder, Dinya Arani. Um, if you're a client of Inova and have any questions post-listening to this podcast, you can call or email us afterwards. You should on the contact details, so feel feel sorry, feel free to call through or email through. As previously pointed out, because this is recorded, um, we won't talk about any managers specifically. Uh, but questions regarding managers or strategies can be asked of us directly if you wish. So please note that um, nothing in this presentation is given as personal advice. It's been designed for um, viewing by professionals only. Um, anyone wanting to make any investment decisions should do so under the guidance of a licensed advisor. So the agenda today, um, our agenda is, uh, sorry, our intention is for Dinya and I to be a little bit more conversational in our tone of this podcast. So we may jump around a bit, but we'll try and keep some structure to it. Um, we have a few backup slides in the appendix, which we may jump to. We'll see how we're going for time. Um, but the general um, structure of what we'd like to go through, we're going to talk about recent market activity, though we're not going to just talk about you know what markets have gone up and what's gone down. We're more going to talk about what's topical, because we think that's more interesting. You can always just go to the news to see what's gone up and what's gone down. We're going to talk about potential systemic risks. Um, we wouldn't be risk managers if we weren't um, constantly sitting around talking about you know, what is out there and what could cause a problem to client portfolios and how that could play out. It doesn't mean it will play out, it just means that we want to be prepared for it um, in case it does. Um, I've got a slide there um, on Australia's uh, lack of recession and unintended consequences that we'll talk about very briefly. And for those of you who receive our weekly blog, um, that is the topic of the weekly blog that will go out later today. Um, we're going to talk about a rising rate environment and what does that look like. Um, and we're going to talk about overall market valuations and uh, market outlook. And as I said, we've got an appendix there that uh, we'll go through if need be. Lots of fun stuff. Yeah, lots of fun stuff. So if I can open up with a question for Dinya. Um, the last few weeks, the oil market's been very, very interesting. Um, there were reports in the press that the Saudis wanted higher oil prices. And given the time of year, they generally do come out and jawbone oil prices higher. But after the press announcements, the Saudis themselves came out and said, no, 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 we have no intention of trying to mm. cut production to raise oil prices. Then um, a number of weeks later, they came out and said, no, we are actually going to look at production cuts to try and drive oil prices up. And then strangely, uh, Donald Trump tweeted that he thought that um, oil prices were too high, something needed to be done about it. Um, and no one's ever listened to any of Donald Trump's oil tweets before in the past. Mm. And yet the following day, both the Saudis and the Russians, almost, almost like they reacted to Donald Trump's tweets and acted to, um, uh, to uh, offer um, yeah. production yeah, cuts to, to drive the price down. It just yeah. seems very strange. Could you elaborate and talk sure, to that? Sure, and I think you know, there's a lot more uh, to it than, than meets the eye. And I, I certainly don't think they were just responding to his tweets. Uh, to set the context there, I mean, the oil price, which when it's high, acts as a tax on the global economy, uh, trended up since February almost 30% from the mid 50s range up to uh, the early 70s range. Um, and then as Dan detailed, recently crashed by about 10%. Um, there's a few different competing forces. I and mean, I don't think it was just uh, Donald Trump's tweet, but talking about the com competing forces, I mean, look, Trump needs to look strong right now. There's a few uh, uh, competing uh, forces here at play. Um, on the one hand, he needs the political win of uh, putting in the sanctions against Iran. And as it would happen, he's also uh, you know, uh, looking at sanctioning Venezuela. Now, they're two of the large global producers of energy and oil. Um, not a good look um, you know, to have high and rising oil prices um, leading into an electoral cycle. So you know, he wants to get the sanctions in place, but obviously that crimps supply. Um, now, the Saudis, on the one hand, you know, all things being equal, 
they actually would want relatively high prices because it's their sole export. They are basically a deficit nation right now. They need prices that are reasonably high, but not too high. Importantly, the Saudis don't want to have really high prices uh, because whilst they do want to, you know, um, get the revenue in and they do want to potentially float part of their state oil company, Saudi Aramco, they've been talking about it for a while. Um, ultimately, they don't want prices very high for very long periods of time because that brings out competitors who aren't as low on the cost curve as they are. So in Saudi particular, the US shale reserves. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So Saudis are able to pump oil, you know, at anything over 4 or 5 or $10. Um, the, the shale producers typically need it to be a, a fair bit higher than that. And as it scales up, competition comes in. But again, the, the Saudis, they also, if you put yourself in their uh, regime's shoes, they rely almost exclusively on US military power to maintain their their uh, um, their rule because, and, the, and their biggest political and, and military threat in the region is actually Iran, which is also another key oil producer. So the Saudis see it as a, a reasonable concession to make. It wouldn't have just been responding to the tweet. There would have been all sorts of diplomatic uh, um, envoys sent across to, uh, to to position things with them, and, and ultimately they would have seen the sense in playing ball there. The Russians are a harder one to, to, to pick, uh, but you know ultimately the Russians are always very logical and you know rational economic actors, um, and they don't actually lose here. They would have been sussing out whether you know the, the whether China will will, will uh, basically you know abide by the sanctions. Um, and if they got the impression that China was abiding by the sanctions, then guess what? There's no real loss to them because um, if Iranian oil is not being purchased by the Chinese, then the Chinese will buy Russian oil. Um, similarly, you know, um, if Iranian oil is off the market, the Russians pick, pick up market share along with the Saudis elsewhere. So they trade price for volume. And at the same time, if they're seeking to placate the US and not be constantly, uh, you know, attacked in the Western media, um, it's it's sort of a win-win for them with no real downside. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, outside of geopolitics and um, uh, oil markets. Uh, we saw 10-year Treasury bond yield rise above 3.05%. Um, uh, now, most listeners would not be aware, but uh, there's a lot of market, market te technicians out there that um, make the claim that 3.05 uh, is the, the light in the sand that yeah. above which the bond bull market is over. It's the bond bear market, you know, it's off to the races, you know, from here, you know, it, it's you know death death to bonds. Bonds are all over. Um, bond markets got up to three point one two percent yield, which means they sold off. So for a bond yield to go up, the price has to go down, i.e., people have to have sold it. Mm. So they got to three point one two percent, and then the market did what the market does best. It made the most amount of people look as dumb as possible, and promptly went from three point one two percent to about a week and a half ago down to 2.75% and is now bumbling around 3.83%, I believe, or 385 um, Amongst this, US equities have held up reasonably well, which is strange because yeah. most equity markets around the world have not held up well because of the uncertainty around the US 10-year uh, Treasury market trying to understand what is going on because they thought, right, if the US Treasuries going above this you know 3.05 technical level and are selling off and the long end of the um, the bond curve is selling off then the discount rate is going up and all equities are going to sell off and everything's bad mm. yet US equities have held up um, and US bonds <coughs> have actually rallied and equities rallied as US um, um, uh, treasuries rallied um, the US has been the source of all the uncertainty and yet it has held up the best amongst the broader marketplace. So yeah. it's been a very strange environment in which to operate. Volatility in the US as measured by the VIX has dropped back down to 13 um, after we saw that spike in February um, and the spectacular blow up the two ETFs um, that were short the volatility complex. Yeah. Um, and yet uh, the US being the source of uncertainty, and yet it has held up the best. So it's a very strange environment in which to operate, but it's one in which we're operating nonetheless. Strange but interesting. Keep showing your toes. So we wanted to talk about um, some potential systemic risks. Now, we're not doing this to try and fear monger people or 
uh, to put a slide in here uh, to make a claim that we're calling a market top. That's not what we do. We're also not doing it to say that we see a trigger for a market collapse. We don't try and pick triggers. We don't think we can pick triggers bigger than, better than anyone else. We don't think anyone can pick triggers. What we try to do is understand the environment in which we're operating in and whether there's a heightened level of uncertainty and what those um, levels of uncertainty are and what if something does go wrong, what could go wrong and what it could mean for portfolios, what is going to be hurt the most and what could potentially profit from it. So I've got four things up there in particular we'll talk about. Um, some of them we'll talk in, we've got some slides on, we'll talk in more detail, and some we'll just, we'll just talk about ad-lib. Um, the one that gets the most press is monetary policy and quantitative tightening. Obviously, off the back of quantitative easing that we've had post the GFC, everyone's talking about quantitative tightening now that the, um, the ECB have said that they're going to taper their bond purchasing program, the Fed are raising interest rates, etc., etc. So that is the number one item that people are talking about. Um, the, set, the one that people are not really talking about a whole lot, but I'm going to talk about a bit here because we don't have any slides on it, um, is systemic strategies. Um, and I'm going to use a corollary to the 1987 crash. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we wanted to just talk about overpriced markets like US markets and some bond markets, and also the Volcker rule and how that plays into credit markets and, and how those two could interplay with each other. Yeah, and we'll explain the Volcker rule. Uh, yeah, correct. That aren't aware of what it is. So look, I'll, I'll talk about the systemic, uh, sorry, systematic strategies first. For those of you who remember the 1987 crash, um, prior to 1987, there were a lot of insurance policies sold to market participants that were uh, systematic in nature that were designed to sell off equities as equities fell. Um, these were not attributed to causing the 1987 crash. However, they had been attributed to the viciousness and causing it to be deeper than what it otherwise would have been because they are systematic in nature and they are forced sellers. Now, we don't necessarily have those insurance products in place at the moment, but what we do have uh, other systematic programs that may in a self act in the same sort of way. What I'm talking about here are things like naive risk parity um, and some smart beta products. Naive risk parity I say because risk parity products run by groups like AQR and Bridgewater are not the ones that I'm particularly worried about. I believe those are being run by groups that really do know what they're talking about and understand risk. But there are a lot of copycats out there that don't really understand risk and uh, operating under the uh, false assumption that um, bonds are always negatively correlated to equities, and so therefore if you hold those two things together, leverage up your bonds, you'll do just fine. We know that's not the case. The 1980s taught us that's not the case. Just go back to 1994 and we can see that equities and bonds can sell off at the same time. So these copycats that are not particularly sophisticated but are run in a systematic nature could be forced sellers into a market if bonds and equity sell off at the same time. By the same token, there are smart beta strategies. Now, we are proponents of some smart beta yeah, strategies, got but you need to be conscious and cognizant of what you're actually buying. So smart beta, by its very nature, is systematic in the way in which um, stocks are selected to become <coughs> part of the index. And so a stock that satisfies a high dividend smart beta product could also satisfy a low volatility product, could also satisfy a high quality product, and could also satisfy a whole series of other products. There has been a proliferation of ETFs that replicate these strategies, um, and those have been largely purchased by retail investors in the United States. And we know that retail investors, in particular, in the US, less so in Australia, but largely in the US, um, those retail investors don't act rationally in, in, in market sell-offs. Right. They are the types of people that will sell off, and by their very nature, these are systematic um, uh, uh, setup programs and systematic setup um, funds. If they're sold, they all get sold off together. There's a hell of a lot of overlap across them. Yep. We could see some sort of you know, an exacerbation of a sell-off if That's that right. were to be the case. And right. particularly because the holders of some of those assets don't understand the underlying factors they're exposed to. 
That's that's exact 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 sorry exactly right. Now, if I go into the next two uh, points, or sorry, the the other points we were talking about, so um, we'll go into monetary policy in a sec because that's the, that's the big one. Um, but let's go into overpriced markets. By almost any metric, the U.S. equity market is overpriced. The probably the most popular valuation metric out there is the Schiller P or the Kate Ten or the um, you know the cyclically adjusted price earnings multiple. Um, <clears throat> it's at the second highest it's ever been. Um, the only time in history it's ever been higher is the tech bubble, but there are other market metrics that are used. Um, uh, it it kind of doesn't matter how you measure the U.S. equity market; it's 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 it's, it's overpriced. Um, but what we know is that things can go from overpriced to ridiculously overpriced. Yep. Um, you know, the tech bubble showed us that um, you know the cape went from you know, 32 all the way up to 44. Yep. What most people don't know is that in 1990, uh, Japan, the Cape of the Nikkei got up to 90. So things can get to ludicrous levels. Exactly. Like we have, we have no idea how high things can go, but they can get crushed under their own weight. You can get to a point where things get so expensive that there is no trigger. They're just, they're so expensive that people just kind of wake up one day and say, wow, these, this is just silly. I can't own these anymore. And they can sell off. Now, the reason this keeps us up at night is that most equity markets around the world are mildly expensive to just being neutral by historical standards. They will probably get sold off as well just because the US is being sold off because it is so big compared to the rest of the world. Almost 60%. Yeah. That's right. On the index. It's not the only expensive market out there. There are a lot of bond markets which are actually bigger than the equity markets that are looking expensive as well. Now, US treasuries are not as expensive as European sovereign bonds. So German bonds look very expensive. Japanese government bonds look ridiculous. So JGBs, UK gilts look very expensive. Yeah. But we can go down the credit spectrum and we look at things like um, high yield. So the chart at the bottom there is um, what's called the yield to worst or basically the, the yield you get on high yield bonds um, in the US. They're as low pretty much as they've ever been. But what is not shown in that chart is that the interest coverage of the companies that make up that index is essentially the lowest it's ever been if there's any interest coverage at all. So these are businesses that are um, providing almost very little yield at all for being non-investment grade at all, not profitable and unable to cover the interest to pay you back the yield that you are purchasing these bonds for. And that's the key, right? Some of these businesses have been kept alive by low interest rates and easy access to capital. And, you know, and their interest coverage isn't good, so it's... Correct, that's exactly yeah, right. In, in Europe, we see um, junk bonds yielding less than US 10-year treasuries. I mean, that's just absurd. Now, the interest coverage is much better in Europe than it is in the US, but junk bonds yielding yet less than 10-year treasuries in the US just does not make sense to us in any way, shape or form. Um, the chart at the top left are uh, triple B rated five-year um, uh, 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 German um, corporate bonds, uh, the spread over bonds. You can see that there's been a sell-off, a small sell-off recently, but still, still at very, very, very low spreads. We're still talking about 100 <coughs> basis points over German bonds, which are already paying nothing. So you're, you're essentially getting no inflation protection or credit protection for owning these securities. Yeah. So these are very expensive markets. These are, these are areas that we don't think um, people are going to be rewarded for the risk that they're taking. They're not getting rewarded for inflation risk or credit risk in any way, shape or form. And that's all we seek to do in fixed income, minimise the potential harm, right? I mean, now is not the time to be taking risk in fixed income. Correct. That's not to say that all fixed income is terrible. Um, we've been proponents of um, investment grade, high quality, floating rate um, instruments here in Australia. This is a chart of the floating rate note um, index. It's just a representative of one way of getting access to that market. Um, you can see the, uh, the spread over cash um, of the floating rate note index is about around its historical norm. Prior to the GFC, you were only getting about seven or eight basis points above cash. At the moment, you're getting about 70 to 80 basis points above cash. 
and that's for for an A to double A rated um, average uh, credit quality instrument or, or, or series of diversified instruments. Yeah. Um, so you know we, th we think that that's not a bad place to, to invest. We like loans in Australia, but we are cognizant of the fact that we're operating in an environment that we haven't operated in before. <coughs> we mentioned the Volcker rule. Um, we, we, we are operating in a credit environment that um, previously um, uh, banks were allowed to operate prop desks and provide liquidity in to an event to the market, to market participants in the event of a credit sell-off. So yeah. I might let Dinya elaborate yeah, so, on that a little so bit more. Some of you may have heard of the Dodd-Frank reforms that, that, that happened post-GFC. Um, they were essentially designed to reduce systemic risks. And what they did were they, they were, they were basically designed to prevent banks from using their own capital for short-term proprietary trading, prop trading, as I say, and speculative investments. Um, so what that's actually, though, created is this issue where all these big suppliers of liquidity to market participants have had to trim their inventories um, and that's going to create a potential problem um, well, we, in, in yeah. the wrong sort of market stressed environment. So yeah, we, 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 the reality is we don't know what that's going to mean. There's um, high frequency <coughs> traders have jumped in and kind of filled that liquidity gap but they're not regulated, they're not required to provide liquidity. So yeah. we don't know in a US equity market or, or credit market or bond market sell-off what that could actually mean. So that's that's why that's one of those systemic risks that we're trying to think about. So whilst we like credit in Australia and we like loans in Australia, we are cognizant of the fact that they could get sold off even though you know the the credit quality of the underlying instruments yep. are absolutely bulletproof and are fantastic instruments to own. They might get sold off just because there's no liquidity available, yep. and you know that just happens. And so people, some people out there are buying some ETFs that, that have you know um, less liquid credit. Oh, and, that, and, and, that's and, proliferating in the US. Yeah, absolutely exactly. phenomenal. Not so much here, but not so much in Australia, but definitely in the US. So. Um, I talked about, so I wanted to talk very briefly about um, uh, uh, Australia and the lack of recession that we've had. Um, 30th of June, we are very unlikely to uh, print a negative GDP growth number, which will mark the 27th year of positive GDP growth, which is cause for celebration, right? Clients of ANOVA should receive um, a weekly blog that we've recently started putting out. and. This is the topic of the weekly blog. Recession has somehow become a dirty word in Australia, as if you know recessions are bad. Look, recessions are bad. They're, they're not comfortable. They're not good. People lose their jobs, or you know, you get pay cuts. There's uncertainty that comes with recessions, but they're actually a healthy part, or they're part of a healthy economy and a healthy business cycle to help wash out excesses in the system. Because when you do not have that washout of excesses in the system. You end up with um, misallocation, quite, misallocation of capital. capital. You end up with, with business models surviving longer than they should. Yeah. You end up with um, people getting credit, getting access to leverage, getting access to borrowing that probably shouldn't. And unfortunately, as that builds up, the recoil from that could be much worse than if those cycles happened more frequently. Yeah. You know, would the um, would the Royal Commission be uncovering some of the stuff that's uncovering now? If we'd had a recession 10 years ago, mm. um, you know, would the financial um, institutions that are being uh, questioned be in the situation that they're in at the moment if they'd had to have gone through a washout? Correct. There wouldn't be the hubris in the cultures uh, there that, that, that allows this sort of behaviour to manifest. Yeah, exactly. So th there's two sides to the coin, right? It's fantastic we haven't had a recession, but there's also the downside to it. And we're just co we're not saying there's going to be a recession. We're not saying that we should have one. We just want to be conscious of the environment in which we operate because we manage your money and we just need to be cognizant of it and what could happen if there's... I, I refer to in my blog the Minsky moment, Hyman Minsky, so have a read of that blog and, and you'll you'll see what I'm referring to there. So I'm conscious of time, the blog, I'm oh, sorry, this podcast, so I won't go into the detail now. Um, the main uh, reason uh, for keeping us up at night is this concept of monetary tightening um, and the main uh, uh, topic of conversation that uh, most people around the world are talking about is the tightening of... 
the Fed's balance sheet or the, or, or the rising of um, uh, interest rates in, in the Fed, um, the reduction of the ECB's balance sheet. And in fact, PIMCO, I've got a chart here talking about um, uh, balance sheet expansion is ending. Yet, if you have a look at it, you can see that balance sheets are continuing to expand. So the in expansion aggregate. In, aggregate. in aggregate, the expansion of balance sheets across the world is going to continue just at a slower rate. So my title here is monetary tightening. What tightening? There isn't any real global tightening. There may be some tightening in the US, but compared to the expansion in Japan and in the UK and in the ECB, it, it's it's really it's it's almost like it's a a, in, in, in a swimming pool you pull a tight you, know, you pull the plug out of the bottom of the swimming pool so drip, a drip by drip by drip is coming in while you've still got a fire hose mm. filling the pool um, so until there is a real um, a real reversal of that monetary tightening I don't think we're going to see the massive sell off that a lot of people are forewarning however let's think about this. Late 70s, early 80s, we had very, very tight monetary conditions. We have very cheap equities. And we have very, very cheap bonds with very high yields. Right now, we have very loose monetary um, conditions with very expensive equities yeah. and very low bond yields. Does that mean we're going to revert back to the 70s and 80s? No, it absolutely does not. But what it does mean that if there is a monetary tightening, we do think that there should be some type of reversion to the mean. And so... We're just conscious of that and thinking that through in what that means for portfolio construction and what are going to be the beneficiaries and what are going to be the, you know, what, what's yeah. going to lose in that environment. And again, we're not trying to pick tops. We're, we're, we're basically very systematic and incremental in what we do. Yeah, correct. Which leads to, oh, that's going to be very hard to read. A market valuation outlook. We talked about it in our quarterly. We've talked about it again um, numerous times. Nothing out there is outright cheap. There are lots of things that are very expensive. There are a few things that are mildly expensive. We don't think now is the time to make heroic calls and allocate lots of capital to one-way bets because of everything we just spoke about just before. Um, there will be monetary tightening at some point. We think now is the time to be prudent. That means you will not be at the top of the um, performance tables. The people at the top of the performance tables will... I'm I'm almost I'm ninety nine percent sure people at the top of the performance tables will be there because of luck, not because of skill. Yeah. Um, it'll be there because they've taken a one way bet and they got lucky that it went their way. Um, there are so many things that could go wrong. Um, we think it makes a lot of sense to just be calm. Don't don't run for the hills. Don't chuck That's everything right. in cash. Don't make a heroic call that hold it in cash because everything's going to turn on a dime and everything's going to crash and you're going to pick the bottom because we don't think you can do that. And a low cash environment means you don't get paid. No you don't rent. get paid to. No, after inflation and after tax, you're actually, you, you're losing money. You're, you, you're worse off. Cash is expensive in this environment. So we think it makes sense to do sensible things. Be more diversified than normal and try and find assets that could make money in a sell-off. So if we think through things that we find attractive, we're actually looking beyond some of the things that we can actually invest in. There are some, there are some esoteric things um, that we can't currently invest in, um, but that doesn't mean that we're not trying to value them or that, that we won't look at them. Um, for example, Spanish equities to us actually look reasonably attractive. Now, we're not going to go out and buy Spanish equities. We couldn't um, even if we wanted to. We're not going to go and do it. doesn't mean we're not going to look at them. UK equities. Brexit has caused fear and loathing of the U the UK market and has made their equity market look quite attractive. And yeah. yet GDP growth in the UK has remained stable, even though every economist predicted that post-Brexit there'd be this huge crash. Yeah. They've all had to revise their GDP growth numbers back up because they were all wrong. And their banks um, haven't been lending very much. Either, so. Their equity, their, their banks look quite stable, yeah. their economy looks quite stable, and their equity market is not cheap, but it is not expensive. And underlying growth, the, the businesses in that in that market looks fine. And the macro level is the pick of the Eurozone. Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Um, what else do we think looks okay? If we could, um, there are a lot of um, Asian currencies look yeah, quite absolutely. cheap. Asian currencies look <coughs> cheap. We wouldn't buy emerging market debt and Asian, maybe some Asian debt. We wouldn't buy emerging market debt because that just looks very expensive, but emerging market currencies have just been beaten down Mm -hmm. and down and down and down and down. But 
China have actually been going around de-dollarizing most of Asia That's right. and have strengthened the balance sheets of most Asian economies, and yet that has not been reflected in the strength of their currencies, which have made their currencies look attractive. Now, we're not going out and buying those currencies, but it's something that we're looking at. But they're playing a long game, and it's effectively a currency cold war, right? So. Yeah, correct. Um, and the last one, look, I'll turn to you to, look, to talk through this one. Sure. Um, look, it's not something that we're allocating to at this point in time, but uh, those of you who've known us for, for a long time know that uh, we have historically, at various points, owned bullion in portfolios. We don't find bullion attractive right now, um, but one thing that we are starting to take more interest in, although we haven't allocated capital there, um, is the mining companies. Um, so again, a very volatile sector. Um, so we wouldn't allocate a lot of capital even if we did find it interesting because it would blow out uh, you know, risk in the portfolio. But when we look at it, um, the bullion price has been uh, you know, relatively steady and, and uh, there's a very decent margin of safety um, in, in some of these producers now. Um, they're not overly priced. Um, and they're raising so, their capital expenditures. So all the bad behaviours of the previous cycle have pretty much been uh, extinguished. New management teams, much more shareholder focused, um, and not interested in building empires, etc. Um, and there's various uh, measures that have been put in place to to, to make sure that uh, you know um, investors have a clearer idea of what the cost of mining is. Um, so all in sustaining cash costs, etc., etc. So. Um, we think it's starting to look interesting. We haven't allocated capital there, but uh, you know, um, you can see there the relative valuation. It's not a sector you would want to own through the cycle, but at certain points in time, it might make a lot of sense. And we're being very watchful right now. It's something that's piqued our interest. And uh, yeah, watch this space if we um, decide to allocate. Yeah, same, same thing with commodities. Not something we want to own all the time, but at certain points you said, you, yeah, you do. So yeah, correct. We're, we're, you know, we're they tend to do well so, late in the cycle. Yeah, so cost of time, we're, we're past the 30 minute mark, so we'll wrap it up there. Um, essentially, uh, we don't think it's time to be heroic. We don't think it's time to make big, um, brash calls. We are trying to find assets that we think that in a market sell off will um, protect capital or potentially could make lots of money. There are a couple of strategies that we've got that could make a lot of money. Um, if this equity bull market and bond bull market continue, those strategies that we've got in your portfolio, they won't do well. They will do badly, but they're there in case something goes wrong. And given the heightened level of uncertainty that's out there in the world at the moment, we think it's prudent not to try and concentrate bets, but to have things in there that could do well, irrespective of the environment, because we don't have a crystal ball and nobody has a crystal ball. And I, I can't think of a period of time of greater uncertainty um, economically, geopolitically, or market in market terms than now, especially with central bank intervention and manipulation of, of asset prices, um, you know, it, it there probably have been periods of history, but I haven't lived through them. That's it's right. just so in un, when you're in uncharted territory, it pays to have a risk focus, and that's exactly what I know to do. Right? So that's what we're doing. So we're just saying, look, we, we just want to understand the environment in which we're in, what could happen if there is a trigger, what we would do if that trigger occurred, what um, would be the losers, what would be the winners, depending on what the sell-off um, uh, would be where it would occur um, and how we would manage your money um, in that environment. And hopefully we've given you a flavor of that today. And also what we're looking at so that we can try and make some money. Um, you know, We're not just looking at uh, what's currently there, but also at things that whilst we may not be able to invest in them today, we may be able to invest in them tomorrow. Just because yeah, something is not investable today does not mean it's not investable tomorrow. Um, you know, The research effort is quite thorough. Um, and we continue to do that um, ongoing. So on that note, thank you very much for your time. We hope you find this useful. Um, you have our contact details. Always feel free to uh, call through or, or drop us an email. We hope you like the format of this um, and feel free to give us some feedback. Um, and that table that was probably hard to read, um, you can probably view it in, in our Quarterly. Yeah, it's it's in the it's in the quarterly it's on our website, and it might be easier to read on on YouTube and you know download it, have a look. Um, and guys, you know, thank you very much. Appreciate your time and your support. Thank you.